Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to kick off our next match where Alliance will be taking on Cloud9 for the second time. And this match could be the battle for second place. If Cloud9 wins, they will be 3-1 and in the group and Alliance will be 1-3. and So this score line would give Cloud9 a very good chance to advance to the quarterfinals on the assumption they can take down Kaboom as well. Uh, let's talk about the matchup. Both of these teams going to look to set themselves up as best they can, but Alliance got some much-needed confidence after taking down Kaboom yesterday. They're still 1-2 and two in the group, Freak. Yeah, Alliance came in with, I think, a lot of hype into this tournament. They are a phenomenally strong team. They proved that they are the best team in Europe through the qualifiers, but we're seeing some kind of strange individual misplays here. Nif... Uh, his Zillion game wasn't super hot uh, in, in the game they lost a little while ago. He had kind of an odd build, had no CDR, had no mana regen, was kind of strange. We keep seeing weird item builds come out. I know Krepo and I love to talk about this for people kind of buy weird things. Uh, but I know the skill is here in these guys. I know that they can be the strategically strong team, the individually strong team. They just need to show up as the team we watched all throughout the summer split. Yeah, and their opponents this game, it is Cloud9. They're 2-1. and one. They dropped the ball yesterday to Naj and Shield. Uh, Crumbs, I feel like their head or their strategy wasn't necessarily in the right place against Naj and Shield. It, it didn't really work out. My big question mark for this matchup has to be high. You know, we saw him perform excellently against Alliance in the first game with the Cinder pick, but Naj and White put high into a champion that is just not beneficial for the team comp. You have Talon, and Talon is not going to set up the team comp and he's not going to be able to split against Zed effectively. So as a shot call, you're kind of just like, oh, well, i got to play without really using my champion to the fullest that I can use it to help my team out. So I think that if Alliance with a redefined idea into their team cup and focusing their bands on high and putting on something that is not going to be a playmaker, he's not going to be able to affect the team, they should be doing pretty well. I actually disagree a little bit there. I think that what High did was fine. He went even in CS in lane, like 90 to 90. The biggest point why that game was lost there was just the bottom lane just wasn't up to par. 2v2, they didn't win the race for uh, level 2 even though they tried. They didn't lane swap even though it would have been beneficial for all parties involved. And Cloud9 has just shown how good they are at lane swaps. And I, I think, I, I just want to see Cloud9 lane swap again and, and show that just, that intellect that Medios has. Short final yeah. thoughts before we get to predictions probably. I think Cloud9 is going to fix their ban pick phase because they know High is going to be focused. So at this point, they get a chance to counter pick mid. So it's up to High to prove that his pool is bigger than what we've seen so far and they can deal with Frog you know, ferocity. Well, let's see <laughs> where you guys are putting your predictions. Uh, Freak, I want to know which side of the Atlantic are you siding with? Cloud9 or Alliance and why? Uh, the best coast, the west coast of the Atlantic, <laughs> the North American team, Cloud9 here. Uh, I think that the loss they had was a little bit uncharacteristic. Even though it was to a great team, I still think that um, they're normally much smarter in their decision making. And as long as they don't hard engage with the late game team comp 20 minutes in, they'll be good to go. Crumbs. I'm going to go with Alliance. I think that Alliance has a good idea as to what to do next after the teams get to know each other. So I'm really looking forward to this matchup. Now, I know that the next two predictions have already been locked in, but the Prophet has spoken. Probably, who's winning this game and why? I'm actually the complete opposite of Crumbs. Not just because I'm choosing Cloud9, but because I think Cloud9 can adapt better than Alliance can. So after these games, I think they're going to be able to fix all their holes in their ship. And finally, Crepo. Yeah, I'm going to go with Cloud9 here, not because I think they're by default the better team. I think a top level alliance at the, at the height of their game can be better than Cloud9, but I, from what I've seen so far, they've been playing really well, and the last matchup just showed the, the disparity in just in terms of like intelligence when it comes to like macro strategy. I think Crumbs is two for two when he's gone against the rest of his analyst in correct predictions. Let's see if he so makes far. three. Yeah, let's see. Uh, let's see how you guys at home uh, have been voting with the fan vote according to LOLesports.com. It is much closer. 54% of the viewers are calling this one in favor of Cloud9. The players are just about ready. So we'll head over to our trio of casters for the next match. But first, Alliance's Shook talks about his growth from a solo queue player to being part of a pro team. I've been playing League since beta. Since I started in three months, like I became really good at the game and I just kept climbing and climbing. Like, I enjoyed the game, but I was also good at it. I was one of the top rated junglers in solo queue. I, I was quite known in high low, but it was both for my, my Lee Sin and for my attitude in game. I know him since season one. In high elo, I was playing a lot of solo queue too. In that time, he had, he had the reputation of being somewhat toxic. 
I had a very competitive spirit. Very often, if the game was to go well, he would just go AFK after like playing his teammates and stuff like that. I just got pissed off and I had to vent somehow and I just chose to do it that way, but it's the wrong way. I was in a team back then. Like I was pretty sure we were going to qualify for the LCS. But three days before the event, I got banned. So not only me, but my team suffered from that as well. And I was more upset about the team having to find a sub jungler in such a short time. It was quite a failure. I wasted basically one year of being potentially in the LCS. I just decided to channel my competitiveness in like a positive way instead of a negative way. He realized that LCS is bigger than solo queue, so he tries to improve every time. What's happened has happened and we don't really care about the man, we look at the person he is now. I wanted to get into LCS, but I just decided enough is enough, like just keep calm. Like, if you get frustrated, just take a break. Let's just play the game where it's meant to be played to have fun. Ever since I saw people play on Worlds, I just said, I want to be there, so I'm gonna do everything I can. I think my expectations of me were pretty high, so when Alliance wasn't really doing that well in the beginning, like, I felt pretty bad, because I knew we were capable of like, beating everyone. I think here in Europe, he, he's just so much better than the other channelers. So he's looking forward to play against better people who can actually challenge him. And he really want to show that he's the best. I'm not really afraid to fail. Like, everyone can have bad games. And it's just something that happens to everybody. Like, no one is perfect. Right now, I respect the Korean teams the most because they've been looking the best to me. But I see some flaws in their play. Like, they make mistakes as well, so if we can capitalize on their mistakes, I think we're gonna have a shot. Despite the rough path, from amateur to number one in LCS, I feel like it's quite an accomplishment. I'm glad I'm in Alliance and I'm looking forward to what the future brings me. Really great to see how Shook just basically turned his entire career around. Yeah, and something that needs to be done as well if he wants to play in the LCS, so. They still need to win this game, though. Well, it is an important one, and I'm sure the crowd here is definitely ready for this rematch between the top teams in the European and North American LCS. So let's get straight into the starting lineups. On the blue side from Europe, it's Alliance, with Wicked in the top lane, Shuck in the jungle, Froggen in the mid lane, Tabzi AD carry, and Nif on support. Yeah, and on the red side, it is North America's Cloud9. Balls in the top lane, Meteos in the jungle, a lot of eyes on high in the mid lane as well with Sneaky and Lemon Nation and Lemon Nation's notebook on support. And we can't put it by Alliance that they just saw their compadres fall farther in their group. Pressure on Europe to really perform now. Yeah, yeah no doubt about that. I mean, SK, of course, already sent home. Yeah. Not looking good for Fnatic. I think Alliance, you know, coming in as the number one seed from Europe, the, the big hopes on them, but Cloud9 is a very scary opponent at this stage. Already beat them once and convincingly. Yeah, and since we're all still kind of recovering from the last game, it's hard to wrap <laughs> our heads around the fact that this game is just as important, yeah. right? If Cloud9 wins this game, they will need to defeat Kaboom to basically guarantee their way out of groups, whereas if Alliance wins this game, they're setting themselves up on a collision course for a tiebreaker with Cloud9 for that next spot. It's just as important as far as losing, dropping out of everything, and winning and still having a chance. So where are the big picks then? What do we see here? We heard a lot there from Shook and how he really wants to test himself against some of the best junglers in the world. Will we be seeing a bit of jungle focus in this game? For me, Shook, you know, we've been seeing that he has been practicing a couple of different things from Korean solo queue. And the fact is he had a ropey start to Worlds. And the thing that I need to track the most here is Cloud9 on red side. They feel like they're pick and ban, especially in this world championship is almost weaker on red side in comparison to their blue side than it has been in a really long time. The fact that Alliance now has the freedom to band out the Syndra and the Rumble really puts a dent into Cloud9's overall strategy. I'm actually very surprised right now that the Zillion and the Maokai are both kind of going through. The last ban for Cloud9 probably has to be Alistair. The top lane has usually been getting the last ban, figuring out how to knock them down just a little bit they get the rumble, it's been focused, so 
That's out of there right away. Balls will not have a chance to play that because of his beautiful record on that champion. Maokai from Alliance, not Cloud9 to answer. And Maokai has been something we've been curious about the blue team banning, and they're they're letting Alistair through. Wow. All right, there's, there's a few things to say about this. Call me a liar. It's surprising, but Cloud9 definitely does their research. They kind of trade the Alistair pick for the Zillion as one. And two, Wicked did not have a good showing on Alistair in the European playoffs. He had some very lackluster games. Balls is a talented Mundo player who can split lanes with Alistair. But yeah, when we see Alistair go through, he's usually a force. I'd agree with you in saying that Wicked wasn't exactly a superstar Alistair player that we saw from him. However, he does have a 100% record with yep, Alistair. They still won the game. Zero. Yeah, exactly. And whilst his individual performance may have been needing some touch-ups, you know, he's put a lot of work in. We were talking to Alliance and they said, Wicked has really stepped it up this time, you know. After his performance where he openly said himself, I played terribly at playoffs. I need to step up for Worlds. And he's done that if you look at the hours he's put in in practice. The question is, can he deliver in a big game like this? Looks now for Alliance. And I'm interested to see what comes out in the jungle because Kha'Zix has been banned. Lee Are they going to do it? has been banned. He's going to pick Ramus. All right. Wow. Awesome. Did it. So, I should have pointed this out earlier, but I pointed out in the first Alliance versus Cloud9 game. <laughs> Cloud9 targeted Shook with bans. They took away his Lee Sin and Kha'Zix. And I said, he may break out Ramus if his two main junglers are banned. In the first game, he picked a Lee did 3% of his team's damage, did not complete a big item, and had a horrible game. Ramus is his most played champion in Korean solo queue by a wide margin. 30 games, the next closest is 10. He goes Sightstone and Spirit of the Ancient Golem with Moby Boots home guards and ganks straight through the lanes. Just had a call from Season 1 and they want their lineup back. <laughs> Alliance going with a pretty old school set of champions here. Of course now, back in the... I don't know if we can say it, Ramos specifically is, you know, back in favor. Certainly for Shook he is and he's been one of the junglers that has changed things around this year. Played a load of Riven mid-season in the summer split. Yeah. For Cloud9 though, let's focus on theirs because they got the Zillion Lucian from the first two picks. They take Rise and Jarvan for their third and fourth. They're interesting lock-ins. We can see why the Syndra and whatnot going out. Shook wanting an easy path. Also doesn't want to ride an equalizer right into the fight. But Medio says that's going to happen. I want to single you out with the Cataclysm. So the Jarvan gets bucked up for him. Not something very played by him, and actually not during the regular season at all. And there's also not much sadder than a Ramus going about 500 miles an hour, getting stopped by Rune Prison. Yep, that Her rise and too. And get a bunch of damage jump down <laughs> on it. slowed by Zillion if you can get out of it. He's going to have to be really creative with the way he initiates here. Well, if there's enough chaos from a frog and an Ari, maybe that's the case. If I really wanted to go old school, a Nibia Corky. Uh, why would they be Corky? <laughs> We've already got Cogmore in there. I mean, at least I mean, Irelia certainly fits that mold. And oh, we're going to be seeing Froggen on Ari. So we, we said this yesterday when we played Nanjin White Shield that we want to see Froggen on a champion that he can come up massive in games. Ari could be that champion for him. He had some really impressive games on Ari in the European playoffs. He actually did a very strange Ari build where he rushed cooldown boots and then a fiendish codec and was basically using it to get off the quickest roam ganks possible and just increase the frequency. But you can only do that if you have absolute command over the mid lane. So it will depend on what high takes and whether it can provide a lot of pressure. What? They would. You could dark binding of Ramus as well they on the way in. They switched this up on us in the last second. I was thinking they had not picked their mid lane yet. <laughs> and they end up going with Morg. I was just penciling that in as a support zillion because I haven't seen Hyde play it much. That's going to be very difficult for Frog to roam on once zillion gets a few points in his time box. Well, we were wondering how these games were going to play out. The first one between these two, quite slow. Would anybody bring out aggression? And I don't think there's a way to go slow when you pick Ramus. <laughs> well, Zillion can certainly slow you down. This is true. Morgana's going to stop <laughs> yeah. you chasing into the team. Ryze has got the similar thing. Even Jarvan has to go a little bit more aggressive yeah, to yeah. knock you up and stop you getting in there. We also saw, by the way, of course, Nif getting his hands on Swapping Alistair. It around. And we yeah. said that Nif's game yesterday on Zillion wasn't the best showing that we've had from Nif. And Alistair's a champion where you've really got to be on your game.
Yeah, there was a lot of fake outs for me. I don't know if Cloud9 and the Lions actually got faked out, but I was a little bit tunneled on the Alistair top lane and the Zillion on support because that's what we'd seen most of from these teams. Uh, but now I'm excited for the difference picks we saw here. Well, I mean, that last game is definitely a difficult one to follow. Yeah. The Fnatic versus OMG encounter, but we'll see if these two teams can match it. And as the players load in, who do you guys think holds the edge in this match? Tweet at LOL Esports using the hashtag ALLWIN or C9WIN, and we'll check out your votes during the game. For me, tough one to call, just based off past experience that we've seen so far up Worlds. I gotta give the edge to Cloud9, but we're gonna find, find out as we get into game. And past experience that we haven't seen. Let's see if Shook can write the book here on how to be Ramus at Worlds. He'll be locking this one in, and he'll be rolling around the rift trying to create opportunities for the team. How will Cloud9 get in on this? Does the warding change kind of when you're playing against a Ramus? I think so. Warding deeper, you have to be safe. I think you have to ward a Ramus once he gets his mobility boots, more like you would ward a Rengar, mm -hmm. because he's going to be coming straight up the lane, most likely, instead of through the wow. river. Uh, also, Ramus is so popular in solo queue oftentimes because he can go through wards and you still don't have the time to react. He's so fast once he gets those mobility boots with his power ball that even if he goes through a ward, you may not be able to retreat in time. A lot of that will have to do with his lane follow-up as well, with which Alliance has built a lot. You can see Wicked in the top lane on Aurelia has been maxing his equilibrium strike. You chain a stun as Ramus flies through ward, he will make it to you. Or in the bottom lane with Nip on Alistair, same thing with the headbutt pulverize. Some very hard ganks to stop. We saw Meteos getting calibrated a bit there. Flag toss a bit short. Next one should be good. Like we said, Jarvan really wasn't his forte throughout the season. So we get warmed up a little bit here in the beginning. Everybody giving each other quite a bit of respect to start this off. And the line of scrim scrimmage is the river. Already wards down in that bottom lane, though. And Cloud9 got themselves inside the brush. So we'll see what they actually go for you, whether they're just going to hang around inside of that top side and hope that Alliance move in there. Of course, the pulverize can be a bit of a problem in these early stages, but Dark Binding may be a good counter to that one, as Meteos here will be starting off by the blue, and Ramus for Shook. Mm -hmm. First time that we're going to be seeing Ramus coming out. That will be starting off down by the red buff. Nif starts out with heal, so... He almost immediately loses his lane presence. He actually used it to try and shove the lane with Trample a little bit while not taking too much harass. But as far as retaliating that Dark Binding, Elias doesn't have any threat right there. I also like the fact that Lemonation picked Morgan to Alistair because Dark Binding can block a lot of his all-ins. It's an old pick for Lemonation. He's played it a ton in... Ooh. He's got good aim, though. He's got fantastic aim. He's really good at champions that require a little bit more setup and mental game because... He's a very good predictor of things. And also, all those picks we were talking about is going to give Shook hell if he tries to initiate with the amount that he can be locked down. It'll be very interesting to see how he works around that. Frogan making sure Medios doesn't make an early visit towards mid. Shook starts off on his blue. Ramus is actually a little bit vulnerable to early counter jungling. So Shook's start, he must feel relatively fortunate here to not be disrupted in any of his jungle paths. And a lot of people don't pick Ramus in competitive play because if he falls the slightest bit behind, he starts feeling really useless. Watching his first few ganks could very well decide this game. Oh, good charm there from Frog and onto High. It's going to give him quite the chunk of damage to put down. Did take a bomb for his pleasure, but that mid lane is somewhere that we're going to have to keep an eye on. We could have also was chunked down earlier on, and again, Ball's going to go quite aggressive onto him, using a lot of mana early on. Looks like we're going to be seeing the first gank coming in as well from Meteos, and of course, I curse that as he walks straight back into his jungle. Yeah, hatching that ward right above Wraiths, and seeing Ball's, like you said, on something that he can be aggressive. He's been put on Shen in the past, and things he has to play safe, and he's been vocal. He does not like that. He likes to be able to fight with the team or even control his lane by himself. More action to the bottom. Nif catching all the bindings. Good hands. Good hands. So there was an old strategy in around season two where Alistair would actually max heal in lane. Uh, CLG used to run it with Vayne often, and they would just use Alistair to take hits while Vayne CS'd. Uh, Nif has yet to choose which skill he maxes, but he's definitely taking a lot of hits and trying to rely on that heal for sustain. It's a sneaky amount of sustain if you put many points into the heal. 
We'll have to track that since they are at a bit of a disadvantage against Black Shield in that lane. Meteos is actually coming through the lane towards that top side of the map as well. Maybe trying to get some early camping onto Wicked. See how that one all works out for him. There's another binding lands there onto Nif. That's Momentum Soil. And a couple of ticks off as well. So Lamination so far been pretty much on the mark. <laughs> That would obviously happen, as I say, <laughs> with his dark binding names is what I wanted to say as one wildly misses and goes through the brush. But I could also argue that he was maybe having a look to see if Shook was in there. Very well could have. I mean, Ramus, we've yet to see that Ramus gank. He is going with a more conservative Ramus style, actually. An early quill coat instead of trying to get boots mobility right away. But the boots are on the way. I feel like that'll be his next box. Kind of rushing towards each one of his camps, probably, as you say, to get those boots. We'll see what kind of effect he can put in the game. Meteos, we just saw him up top a little bit ago, paying consideration to Wicked on his Aurelia. It can and will wreak havoc if he gets a good laning phase. As you are saying before, Joe, Wicked also stepping up for the team, and when it goes well, the team also starts to play well around him. So if they can get that going, thumbs up for Alliance. And they need it. They need Wicked to go big. They need Froggen to go big. I mean, Shuck's playing Ramus in pretty much the <laughs> game that decides and if you go any further true. worlds. I really want to see the effectiveness of that Ramus as well. Looking at all the things that Cloud9 has picked here, I mean, even just a black shield on whoever he powerballs into will deny the taunt. So he's going to have to be really creative. Hopefully he can just get farmed. Ramus has some of the best health scaling in the game in the sense because if he puts his defensive powerball, it gives him so much armor and magic resist, his effective health goes absolutely crazy. Uh, but that takes, once again, a lot of farm. And I don't know if Alliance has that kind of time. Well, they'll have some time. Seeing the tears on the side of Cloud9, it gives them a bit to work with. Not a lot of damage is going to be coming out just yet. Medios again consideration towards the top lane and Wicked he's not liking the situation he's gonna go ahead and hug turret because he's got a real nice push on this wave and this is kind of a, an old version of how to beat CLG EU you know camp that top lane <laughs> catch Wicked out of position while he's playing his Aurelia that's what teams did to try and yep. take down the old CLG team and honestly why not I mean it worked back then I feel that Wicked now, he's going to be ready for something like that. He's playing this one very safe as Froggen just flashes a charm by height. And again, gets the bomb back on his head. Definitely seen out there. They have the idea of where Froggen is. That means Wicked now goes aggressive before he was playing completely passive. But that instance of knowing where Medios was, he wants some damage. Really good damage, too. It's the Sheen Rush for Wicked. It's something he's been relying on. He gets such good damage trading with his Equilibrium Strike plus the Sheen proc from his auto attack just to burst him down. And Rise is a very vulnerable little guy up there early on in the game. Well, we've yet to see Ramus come rolling out of the jungle. And he's going home again. 37 CS he's got. He farmed really well. Farming, six, yeah. yeah. A lot of farming in there. And we'll come back in with yeah. that, those boots of mobility. So this is where he can really get going. He kind of pulled the Meteos on Meteos there, where instead of trying to pull ganks early, he just did a bunch of farming while he relied on his lanes not to die to ganks, and then outpaced the enemy jungler. He did hit level 6 first. He has more CS. He's got his boots of mobility first, whereas Meteos is still clearing jungle. What's his focus? Every lane supplement this crowd control that he brings as well. Stuns from all. Charm in the middle. Looks like he'll go back for blue to make sure he can get power balls off more. Actually, he's going to give this one up to Froggen as usual. Didn't think Froggen was going to have time to step aside. He has time for everything. Wave pushed up in this bottom lane, looking for these guys to hit six as Sneaky's done that first. And it looks like they're going to pay balls some attention here as he hatches that one. Just sitting on a ward. I'm a little concerned here why Shook is trying to gank through the river when Ramus ganks so amazingly through the lanes. Uh, bit of wasted time there for old Ramus. I wanted to reply with just okay, but <laughs> I feel like we could get a fourth caster in here just to provide that for us. The Ramus commentary. And, and, and okay every now and then will okay. certainly add to the atmosphere. Shook actually on top of a pink ward there. We'll put a pink down of his own. And spots that one that's actually been down for quite a few minutes. And Shook is going to be getting some clearage going on. So, where is he going to be able to get involved in the game? Because it's all well and good farming up. If, you know, you need to make impacts here. You need to be able to get in there, get your lanes going. I suppose you could argue that while Meteos is farming as well, Shuck could technically just keep playing that game. Oh, 
Transcendent Blades onto Balls in the top lane. Wicked with the level advantage and the CS advantage here, playing it very nicely. I don't know if we're going to see more pressure. Shook's kind of, he doesn't know where he wants to go right now. He's kind of just hovering. He still wants to punish that top lane. Something that happened in Cloud9's first game against Alliance is they allowed the Aurelia through. Now Alliance is going to try and punish. Uh-oh. Yeah, I'm not sure the ball's actually meant to put down the stun on towards Wicked there. Chuck comes rolling on through. First gank results in a first blood, but Chuck might be in a little bit of trouble. Going to be chased here by Meteos. Oh, High is actually coming around as well. Flash Going to get ball. the speed up there. Is the bomb coming down? I think that's enough. Yeah, the auto attack will help, and High is going to take down Chuck. I have to say, Balls did not play that gank properly. You would want to Rune Prison the Ramus and then run away from the Aurelia, but they were pretty close together. And then they also killed him not even near the turret, but at least he prompted the overdive. He knew he had the collapse coming back up. So he is behind Wicked's Aurelia, which is really scary, but at least he gave high a kill. So it's kind of a trade. A little bit of back and forth, but Wicked to that Triforce faster, a very scary thing. He is not afraid to put his foot down and start making plays for the team. See what kind of advantage can be grabbed here in the bottom lane. So far, it is a 20 CS lead in favor of Sneaky. Shook charging up zoom, here. Zoom. Looks like he oh. could zoom. That's a, going to be a face-to-face -face hit up. Wow, Meteos in the back pocket of high here. Gets the Zillion all down. The Ignite will not tick fully, so he's not going to come back stronger. Might have given them a chance to re-engage. But they back off for this one. Summoner's blown in the mid lane. And actually, Shook there going for home guard, so... He's going to be coming yeah, out of base is... with roughly four and a half thousand move speed. <laughs> that is the <laughs> rough estimate of his move speed. It's also the common build you see on Jungle Ramus. It's very much solo queue, but it's also the most effective way of building Ramus. We'll see how quickly he goes back. Generally, you just burn a bunch of health and mana and you don't clear the jungle too optimally, but that doesn't matter because you get back to lane in an instant with home guard power. Points. And it creates such a dynamic too that Cloud9 has to think about. The window for jungle ganks usually slows down after you get a gank, but he is going to be back every time and something they can be caught off guard with. Not caught off guard on the first dragon. That goes over to Cloud9, 12 minutes on the clock. And that was basically just balls going bottom lane instead of back to the top lane. It will hurt him in the short term, and I think the main threat for Cloud9 here is if Wicked can run over balls in that top lane, because based on the team comp here, Cloud9 needs that mid-game power spike, and they, therefore they need balls to actually get to his Rod of Ages pretty quickly. And if Wicked is able to overcome that with a more powerful Aurelia that can then roam down and start taking over the game, it will throw a pretty big wrench into Cloud9's plans. Throwing from Nif here. Up and shook it in some wards. What is this death squad looking for the top lane? They considered let's get balls again while he's up here. Wait a minute. Balls isn't in his top lane. Four people to the top side here. Maybe they'll get a turret out of this one. Wicked's been freezing it the whole time, so they think balls is standing in his turret. Yeah, they're prepping for a dive. Instead, they're going to get a turret, and it's actually a turret trade. It's almost like an early game lane swap, except it's happening in 13 minutes. <laughs> yeah, and they lost the dragon just before that, which I suppose is very much a lion style. You know, we're not comfortable enough to challenge for the dragon, give it away rather than resulting, uh, rather than losing a few kills as well. They do get that top turret back, but leaves them a oh. thousand gold behind the Shook is gonna find balls here. Let's see if balls can actually get away. Nip moving in, the bombs start to come down. Charm will land onto balls, but they've not got enough damage to finish. Yeah, nice defensive showing there by High to just prevent the all-in since it would have been chrono shifted away regardless. Alliance? He's in a pretty peculiar position right here. They burned a lot of their stuff to get that first catch on the ball, so they don't really want to show into the mid lane now. They're picking the top lane from Balls. He says Wicked is MIA at this point. Doesn't look like they really have the flank to get in on anything here. Good wards coming in from Cloud9 and both Alliance to try and make these work. Nobody really coming up with too big of an upper hand. The gold from the objectives in favor of Cloud9. And these lanes have opened up quite quick. There's a lot of roaming here. Whoa. There we go. Yep. This call is not the same that was for a home moves. guard Ramis than it is for anyone else. <laughs> because he gets back to mid lane in about five seconds after recalling. He just bought a ward. Like, that was his only reason for recalling. But he filled up his health and mana, and then he just goes and takes the ward. 
funnily enough, I wasn't all that far away with four and a half thousand movements. <laughs> well. Reaching a thousand there, speeding out of base. Frogger will be getting his blue buff gifted over to him. Has a lead in the lane in terms of CF, but of course, High does have that kill with Zillion. Themes will be coming up first for High, along with his tier, of course, getting stacking. So, building up those minor items. Similar scenario for balls in the top lane tier, and has got the blasting one. So, Rod of Ages will be coming into play soon. Trinity Force for Wicked, though, is a big item. Pretty crazy how much Balls is trying to avoid this top lane. They do not want to give Wicked any bigger of an upper hand other than CS at this point, but Balls will fall farther and farther behind as this happens. And that's the big reason Balls is avoiding Wicked in that top lane. I mean, Wicked is, unless he's willing to push into the second tier turret, right. uh, not going to pull much pressure up, he should probably be pushing this as quickly as possible. However, he actually doesn't know where Balls is. He's hoping that he's denying him CS up there. Balls is just willingly denying himself. It's a potential danger, actually, because he is still going to fall behind in experience and gold. He's now two levels behind Wicked. Oh, should might be in a little bit of trouble here. Although, there is a ward down. So they spot Cloud9 coming in. Cloud9 do get that vision down. And know that they need to be careful now on this bottom side of the map. There is the binding actually giving the position away. Shook says, you know what? I'm just leaving you guys to this one. Let's see if they can actually hold. Looks like they will because Sneaky and Lemon Nation not going to push any further. A lot of forward wards put in this one by Cloud9. Let's see how they act on these instead of letting them get swept out. Meteos actually is going to just protect high as he backs in the mid lane. Shook standing on a ward as he throws one down. As have not seen gank coming from him too much. On the Rammus, it's been more of just in and out. Put some wards down. Not too many ganks yet. Yeah, and with the Sightstone now, he's really heavily involved in vision control. Was not able to impact his lanes that greatly. However, the one lane he did impact was impacted in a very huge way. It's the largest discrepancy we see in this game. And you can tell Balls has to 100% avoid Wicked. It's a huge amount of map pressure lost. And if Wicked can make it down to this next Dragon fight, it will be very interesting. Well, they are starting to move in. More wards cleared out by Meteos and Lemon Nation. Bottom lane is pushed up though in favor of Alliance, so they can choose to get a bit of free turret damage. Wait until this next dragon comes in. There is a nice little binding throw into the brush, which will catch directly onto Shook. Alliance decided actually not to follow through on towards the turret. They do, however, have vision of Meteors coming down. Wicked throwing in a giant's belt after the Triforce. Both him and Tabs now have that finished up. So this dragon in 30 seconds. Some nice item spikes there. Sneaky getting his Infinity Edge in as well. So a lot of lanes staying close. Yeah. Barring that top lane. Oh, good trade back and forth. Probably about even. And Wicked is just so strong right now. Even if there's evenness on other roles, yeah. he could completely turn the tides of this fight. It's all eyes on Wicked for Cloud9. How can they avoid this massive Aurelia that actually has a lot of health with the Giant's Belt? and be able to continue to contest objectives. Well, we're gonna find out here as that dragon does come live. We can actually head us to push the bottom lane out. We are seeing blue buff about to be given over to high. Aid him in this next fight. Alliance certainly have positioning on that one and Lemon Nation there stood right on top of a ward will allow them to see that binding coming through. The charm almost landing there, but didn't actually connect an Alliance. And moving for this bottom tower. Even on the bottom side of the map, Wicked getting free farm. Now Shook and Nif joining him. Frog will be there as well. How are Cloud9 going to react? A nice minion wave in mid. will be able to split open the map for them. Wicked made, or Cloud9 made some pretty critical mistakes in their loss to White Shield yesterday, where they had a mid game disadvantage, but they continually forced fights. Right now, their mid game disadvantage is against the Aurelia. So everywhere Aurelia goes, they're trying to avoid. However, Alliance did beat them to the spot. And then they're leaving Balls, the guy who has been behind oh. back to guard. This is not going to work out too well. An inhibitor turret, sub 20 minutes coming in for Alliance. This is a I mean, stark stop difference there? from Why the stop there? There's only three people from Cloud9 defending. This is an interesting one indeed as they are going to go towards Balls. Takes all the damage, flashes away. He's got the Krona shift on. Looks like Cloud9 might be able to hold them off. Shook sure, actually getting the heal there to keep him alive. He didn't quite finish off that in inhibitor, but they may be headed off here as they try to escape. Hopefully buying some more time for themselves, Frog and flashing. 
already with the Spirit Rush down. That's one to two lockdowns. They could be cleaning this one up now. That's going to be Sneaky picking one up. No. Oh, yes, he does. He does grab one. Transcendent Blades coming off from the side here from Wicked. He throws a few out for the fans. He does get a kill for himself. What a strange series of events there. Cloud9 was opting into the trade, and then they kept two people around for a little bit longer. Now they think they have a free dragon, but not everything in League is free. No, big grouping. Here comes Shook as well. They're going to go in towards high. He's got his ultimate back up, though. Bomb on Wicked said Meteor's actually going very, very low. But where's the focus here? Everyone's low, but no one's down. Sneaky finishes off Nif. Shook's going to fall low. We'll, we'll be able to roll away. Wicked went super low as well. And you have to feel that Alliance could have done better with that scenario. Something you have to keep in mind when you're running Alistair and Rammus is it is an incredibly low damage combo. So that's why that fight didn't go this way. We'll take a look at this fight once again, though. Black Shield, super critical. Shook was trying to flash for the taunt, could not get it there. And honestly, Chrono Shift against a low damage team is remarkably efficient. Despite it being a 3v4, they could actually hold off Alliance. Alliance put a lot of investment into the inhibitor turrets, which is one of the reasons they didn't win that fight as well. Obviously, the collapse here, Froggen flashed away early. Meteos ulted on for the secure. He had to flash out of his own creation because he was going to take too much damage. And Cloud9 was able to pick up a few kills. If they aren't punished, for that open inhibitor. It was a great trade for Cloud9. Alliance is going to continue to trade turrets though, and it be, may be a bit too much to bear for Cloud9. A bit too much indeed. You see Lemon Nation saying we need more damage. Needlessly large rod after his sight stone as well. They are trying to be able to put out the power in these fights that alone Wicked is pretty much bringing right now. And the rest of the team is just going to scale up later. Tabs waiting to get to that point. These guys are going to be ferocious come another 10 minutes. Cloud9 really does not have an answer just yet. Lots of pink wards, that's really all they got to defend with. Yeah, but six turrets means their map pressure is slim to nil. Cloud9 with the Zillion wants to accelerate this game, but at the moment, because they are down six turrets, they're pushed into a different mindset. Medios is caught. And he's dead. Tab will pick up that kill and a nice little bait using that pink ward to try and lure them in. Cloud9 thinking, okay, we can get rid of that wall. Actually, there is High gonna oh. get caught out. They oh, leave him up here. Wicked's gonna keep chasing him down. There is Ramos rolling on forward. Decides not to go too far, though. And that was just a nice catch by Alliance. It's what they're going to continue to try and do. Ward control in the jungle of Cloud9 and get the small pickoffs. They're very careful about that chrono shift from high, and Lemon Nation is also being very careful about his black shield placement. Eagle Eye, dark bindings to come out, saving his life there, along with the black shield. Sneaking balls, trying to be a two-man team as they push down the mid lane. Those turrets, they have already dropped though, but they can't afford to spread themselves thin right now. It's gonna be the buddy system as they have to clear out some of these wards. Alliance is left behind. Slow play right now from Cloud9, but not the case for Alliance. An entire split, an entire year for them to really produce this type of team. And it was shaky at the start coming into world, but definitely showing up. Right, when we look at Alliance's story as a team, they had a very slow start. It took them a while to learn how to play as a team, but also to play against their opposition. They built the team though to succeed at Worlds. Yeah. Now at Worlds, you don't exactly have very long to adapt to your opponents. Their first round in this group, Not a luxury. they went one and two. They have to adapt now if they want to make it out of the group and find victory where they previously found defeat. Well, let's see here, Froggen trying to get the cash on to hide inside of his own jungle once again. Didn't quite get in there. Meanwhile, Sneaky, quite happy to just push through. He's going to be taking the fourth turret of the game for Cloud9. And we're 23 and a half minutes into this one and 10 turrets are down already. Well, there are a few turret kills in the last game, so maybe they're taking cues. We'll see if this one ends a little bit faster than Fnatic vs. OMG. It's just as close here, though, in the mid game. I do wonder how Alliance is going to find the right type of picks because the Chrono Shift and the Black Shield are big blockers for Alliance trying to find the right kills. This is Scepter coming in from Frog and interesting as you see the Deathfire Graph trying to pop a zillion, trying to pop the support, but he goes through the magic resistance plus that magic shred, so. Well, they're really trying to diminish the damage from high and balls at the moment. They don't think he's at a point where he is an adequate threat yet. Plus they have Rammus who can just be the one guy to taunt him and take all the Lucian fire. Well, then they just have to worry about the magic damage. And with that DFG, High's just going to ulti whoever gets hit with a DFG as well. So we'll see how this one all works out. 
Waiting for Nif to maybe get started here because once he lands a decent pulverize, it's good follow up with the charms coming through. Actually, Cloud9 here. Headed straight down this middle lane. They want to go on this inventory. Lemonation's really low on mana for Cloud9 to be posturing so aggressively. That's what Nif sees. He goes. The double headbutt pulverized from Nif with his ult on. They're on to Taz, but it's only Meteos. Ball's trying to focus that. Chrono Shift's going to come back up for him, but they're standing in tremors right now. And it's a lockdown kill on to Taz. The Cathian surprise to deliver out the damage does not help. But Balls is on the run here. Alliance coming up on the fight overall. Actually, a 2-2 nope. across the board. The magic of Zillion. It seems like they would actually have an edge, but they have to kill Balls twice. Tabs and Nip actually get singled out by Sneaky on the other side of the fight while Wicked was diving Balls really aggressively. And somehow, Cloud9 gets away with pushing a little bit deep. One side, Froggen might be trying to go up this mid lane here. Cloud9 actually full on recall from those three remaining men that didn't go down during that last fight. For Froggen though, it was just a case of clearing out on that middle lane. So let's watch this one again. Started off with the lines getting bound up there by Elimination. Yeah, obviously though, Nip is a little bit too strong to focus. And Wicked, sorry, I was wrong, was looking at Sneaky, but then decided to kill High. I'm trying to figure out exactly what happened to Kog'Maw. Meteos just killed him, yeah. straight up. And then Nip's ultimate ran out, so Sneaky was able to get the secure there. A very spread out and somewhat chaotic fight, which we will probably see a fair bit of considering all the single target damage on Alliance. They will need fights to be a little bit spread out to avoid dying to what will be a lot of AoE from Cloud9. And I'm interested to know what the comms are for Cloud9 right now. Usually only high in the team fights, but he's got so many different things to think about with being a Zillion. Who's he speeding up, slowing down? Who's he throwing Chrono Shift on? Is it really him still calling the shots in these fights? Five pick wards down the line as Alliance or Cloud9 is trying to stave off the push that Cloud9 or Alliance. Oh, just looking at what's on the screen and saying it, <laughs> Alliance is pushing down, and we'll see if they can do that. Well, if there's one thing I always want out of a zillion who's on my team, Riv, it's someone who's willing to say I got you. And since right. I speak so much on communication and the team has so much trust in him, it makes sense that he will be able to deliver those ultimates on the right targets to prompt aggression. Mm. But it's still going to be difficult with all those charms flying around. Alliance again pushing up that bottom wave, because an open inhibitor. Cloud9 doesn't have vision control over this dragon. Oh, it's real dangerous. Whoa! Oh, Meteor's going right between them. The Elimination going to get taunted in, but who are they going to go for? Wicked diving in the back to good ultimate from Elimination. And the Cullen is going to go through them. Ball's got the ultimate on him from Zillion. Lemonation still alive here. Finally a flash in front of They've managed to lock up Balls, but he gets the kill onto Froggen. Shunk will actually go down as well. Balls are still going. Are you the and the bomb will get another one. Triple kill for Tabs on the other side, though. It's a four for four. How? Miraculously is the only <laughs> word I can say right there. Alliance's low damage as a team really cost them there because the revived balls cleaned up and they were never quite able to finish off high despite Where did this go? Meteos burning everything for vision. <laughs> the fight starts, obviously, and now Cloud9 gets a decent amount of AoE down, but really, they were caught with their pants down when they checked this spot right here. Meteos dies pretty much without doing anything. Obviously, Tabs is wrecking face in the back of the fight, but he's the only one really able to wreck a large amount of face. Froggy gets killed by the balls that revives, and then it's just a comedy of no damage right here. Ramus, Alistair, they can't do anything. Tabs isn't at range yet until the last hit, and Rise plus Zillion take out a bunch. Balls has been the focus of that Chrono Shift just about every single time. You can see him bringing out a blue elixir for this one. Cloud9's definitely want to get back to the fight. The teleport into the Death Rush. Calling coming out from Sneaky. Meteos missing the flag and drag on that one. And that is the re-engage. A nice orb of deception through the whole team from Froggen. But he's locked up right now. Can't deliver any more damage. They pick up one. They pick up two. They're on the balls now with the Pedwa Pulverize. And they are going to get four kills for themselves. They're not going to lose any this time, though. Finally, Alliance finds the fight they needed, and it's because they continually pushed the envelope. At that point, Meteos could not find the right engage. The triple kill that Tabs pulled off in that last fight gave him some powerful items, and they really just, that time, used the power of Wicked for a fight victory. Chuck wanted some health, they're going for Baron. Speeding on again, out of the base, and Hyde just going to recall you. Spend up what he's got, heal back up, but Alliance are going to pick up the Baron. 
And a crazy little fight, and this time they did it right. They waited for the Chrono ship to come down, step back and said, okay, let that run out, and then we can fire him once again. Yeah, now with the Baron, they may be able to go and get the Dragon. They're just going to keep the pedal to the metal here. They were criticized heavily for not being able to capitalize on an advantage against White Shield, and also the entire game against Cloud9 because they had a slight disadvantage. Let's see if they keep pushing the envelope here. Wicked, though, in the wrong lane without teleport. Cloud9 might be able to take a Dragon, but it will cost them turrets. Cost them turrets, indeed. They're getting everything that puts gold in their pocket, but... Gold items are not working. We see the Zanyas up from Lemonation now. Providing a little bit of help in the last fight. But with all those things being down, like you said, Joe, the Chrono Shift, that Zanya is down. Those are the things Cloud9 needs to win these fights all the time. The Alliance just being ahead makes it that much easier. Let's see this again. Yeah, it was just a really poor engage by Cloud9 and a great disengage by Alliance. Vito's used this flag combo for nothing and Balls teleports in to a disengaged alliance. At this point, Lemonation's like, fine, I'll do it. But the rest of the team had already used all of their initial initiation. He gets a stun off, there's no follow-up. In the back line is a whole bunch of pressure from Alliance. What is becoming a very strong tank line of Wicked plus Shook, Aurelia, and Ramis is a little bit too much to deal with for Cloud9. Sneaky can't clear out those champions just because of base stats, and they've stacked enough MR that the balls rise and the high zillion can't get it done. Yeah, just getting himself that blue buff. There's a lot of wards down here for Alliance, and that's another point that they've been criticized on. Their vision, if you think back to that white shield game, oh, man. you can argue that they walked far too often into yeah. darker areas of the map where they've just not got the wards down. Cost them the game in the end, but this time looking to not make that, second, uh, that same mean, mistake twice. Yeah. Ruby Sightstone and a Spirit of the Ancient Golem by Shook. Even if his wards get cleared out, he's going to have a whole bunch more to place down. Ward clearing has been better this game for Alliance as well. You can see Pink Ward's already down on the map, but Pink Ward's still in their inventory, something that the best teams so far at the World Championship have kind of been doing. Alliance was actually second worst in the group as far as wards killed going into this game. I expect they're going to move up a little bit in the rankings after this one. Yeah, just a tad. It'll be interesting to see those stats at the end of this one, which might be quite soon with Ferocity Alliance has put into this game. We will see High getting caught up there. May not have time. Even Chrono Shift, he wishes he could turn back time on that one. The inhibitor is going to be locked down here for Alliance. 32 minutes, and they are pressuring the base quite hard of Cloud9. Cloud9 so reliant on Black Shield and reaction time, but with cooldown boots, once Shook gets that flash taunt, it's two and a half seconds of not being able to cast that Chrono Shift, and they burst him down faster. Second inhibitor gonna be pressure. There's Frogger moving in the charm. Did in fact go wide there, but Alliance come into the base with that Baron buff on, get two inhibitors down. Now they're just gonna go straight to that top lane and start pushing that one through. And we, you know, Alliance's composition here, they're quite happy to go under the towers and they can blast you from range, especially when you've got the light of Cogmore in there. It's definitely a change. Speaking with Cloud9 and watching their games, it was slow, slow, slow. Even against Kaboom, they said, we didn't want to make mistakes. Nothing silly, we'll play it slow. Alliance is attacking that right now. And the slow is not working for Cloud9. No, Cloud9 is out of time as well. They didn't necessarily want to play this game slow. That's why we saw so many mid-game skirmishes yeah. and just flat-out giant team fights too. But they lost the fights. Alliance was the victor, and they, with two inhibitors down now, are in prime position to end this game in the next few minutes. Let's take a look at this last flash taunt. It's just something I didn't expect. Well, blam. Very last edge of that taunt. And yeah, there's nothing high could do since the Black Shield was actually on Lemon Nation instead of high. And not quick enough to get the Chrono Shift onto himself there either. And I mean, there was a split second where he yeah. wasn't locked up but there, at, so... But at the right. same time, you don't want to just use a Chrono Shift as soon as someone flashes on you. You need to use it right before someone dies. High can't be in the front line. Obviously, oh. hindsight is 2020, but Shook had the faster fingers there. So Alliance finally got this wave pushed up on the top side of the map. Shook actually is going to walk on straight into that minion wave. And actually should get behind or away from his minions there to stop that bomb just wiping out that entire wave. 
without that, I think Alliance is still going to be playing this one cautiously. And I will say, just a great job of Alliance to stack magic resistance. They've been playing these fights perfectly, almost ignoring the magic damage threats because of their items and being able to get sneaky in positions where he can't deal that much damage. It's worked wonderfully. Wow. That graph really telling the story of this game very, very close most of the time. Been in Cloud9's favor as well, that gold lead, but big swing coming in for Alliance as Nif just threading those super minions up through the middle lane. They've actually got super minions going on to the Nexus turrets. They might have to give this one up. Wicked with the Guardian Angel, not afraid to go in on this one. Nice soul shackle from Lemon with the Zanya's down, but he will follow quickly going down. Meteos is going to be the next one hit up. Could this be game already? The minion waves are hugely pouring in for Alliance right now. They could look to seal the deal. Ball's one of the last ones standing. Sneaky on the outside is just charmed right in. And it was a beauty. One more shot coming in from Tabs does not take down high. And it looks like they are ready to seal the deal. Well, so. the minions are already killing it. Fallen there. Yep. First Nexus straight went down without any problem. And Alliance is going to go for one last kill here. On to high to give them the ace and will be able to finish off the game, tying them with one apiece now with Cloud9, which means this group could be going tiebreak. Wide open. It was a very impressive performance there by Alliance. They played crisply and they also played quick. All things that were lacking from their defeats thus far in the group stage. Smart anonymization, they worked around the pick and ban well with some unconventional things getting through. They capitalized on the Alistair, they withstood the Zillion, and they came out victorious. And it caught completely in half, a 35 minute game instead of a 70 minute one. Much more definitive here, coming out from Alliance. And wow, Shook bringing out the Ramus, getting in the heads of Cloud9 as much as they could. And it seems like, as Cloud9 said, they were a bit shaky coming into these big bands. They wanted to be stronger with Meteos going on to Jarvan. It did not seem like the engagements they wanted when they wanted the fights. No, and that's the thing. If you, you know, you put a lot of focus in bands onto Shook, you take away Kha'Zix, you take away Lee Sin. With those, especially the Kha'Zix, do you also hinder yourself? Exactly. It's a good question. Meteos hasn't played much Jarvan in competitive play. I it wasn't a terrible pick or a bad pick by any means, but he did not find good initiations with Jarvan, that's for sure. And Shook did find good initiations in tandem with Wicked, who, by the way, went off. That's a big thing that I think will change in the rest of these group matchups. It's his best champion by a mile, it seems like. Obviously, Rise has been banned against him. He has a lot of faith in his own Rise, or it's been picked away. But maybe targeting Shook isn't the right option. No, and Cloud9 also had a lot of faith in that Aurelia as well. Not good faith, they were afraid of it. Ball's just leaving the top lane saying, I died once, I don't want to go back there. That's going to be a huge crutch for us, and it, it actually was in the end still. And as we talked about after this game, this does some crazy things to the group. Right. They're both 2-2 two and two now with games against Najin and White Shield and Kaboom left. Since they are tied in their own head-to-head, -head, they may not even get a tiebreak. If one of them beats Kaboom and Najin and White Shield, which Alliance was very close to doing, they would just jump out of the group by themselves. I'm very excited for the next day and a half. <laughs> well, it also sets up Kaboom to, you know, whilst not many people are expecting now to pull off a, a thorn big in the side. Streak, mm -hmm. Yeah, they could spoil worlds for either yep. one of these teams if they're able to pull off a bit of a shock victory. I can't wait for that to happen <laughs> if it does, because it's been a rather ridiculous day so far. We had the Fnatic 70. We've only had two games yet. Game. It feels like three, <laughs> you know? There were enough inhibitors killed in that first game oh, to yep. warrant a whole day of matches, it feels like. And yeah, obviously Alliance feeling like the last European hope here. They needed to win this game, and now they're 2-2 two and two in the group, still in position to make it out. And they did step up. People are definitely going to realize Wicked gets going. The team feels good around it. Froggen said himself, if things happen, it's on me. But it seems like everybody's taking a bit of the weight to even it out as well to make it a lot easier throughout the game. And you got to, you know, it's all well and good Froggen saying it's my fault if we don't succeed. Yeah. It's my fault yeah. if we don't win and do well. But at the end of the day, League of Legends is a five on five team game that every single component of that Alliance lineup needs to be really on the ball if they're to win. Yep, and Froggen was good that game, but the rest of his team was honestly better. It was Wicked and Shook getting those ganks early on. It was Nif finding the initiations and it was Froggen following up and being a good teammate.
Well, as the teams keep fighting for those spots in the quarterfinals, don't forget to keep sending us your favorite plays to us on Twitter at LOL Esports, along with the hashtag World's Big Plays. For now, though, we're going to send it to Shox, who's standing by with one of the winning players from Alliance. Thank you very much, Joe. I am indeed joined here by Alliance's Frog, and after that victory over Cloud9, uh, Frog, talk to me about you guys' composition. We saw the Ramas coming out there for the first time. Interesting pick. Yeah, so Shuk has played quite a lot of low elo solo queue in Korea, and everybody picks Ramos and Fiddlesticks, so he just tried to pick up Ramos, and it seems like it worked out. It absolutely did. Uh, talk to me about your pick for Ari, and your quite defensive build going into this. Why did you decide to play it like that? Um, generally, all the team is really squishy for coming into the mid game, and all I have to do is dish out a lot of damage, and it doesn't matter if I focus one target on Ari because they have Zillion, so it's better just to get tanky and more consistent damage output. And it also reduces everybody's magic, uh, magic resistance, which means Kogma can deal a lot more damage. So it's just overall a really good build, I feel. Yeah, great build, great uh, strategy in this game overall. Tell us a little bit about what happened in the first days here, not the alliance we're used to seeing. Yeah, we had some problems with our team compositions. We picked team compositions, it's really out to play correctly. And this game, we tried to pick a, an easier composition and we got some really OP champions, so it worked out better. Um, how do you reflect on that personally? Because, of course, there's so much hype coming in and the people saying, Froggen is a real deal. Does it matter to you in the end as long as you get the, the win? Uh, it doesn't really matter to me in the end because, like, this game, like, Ramos and, like, Shuk and Wicked played really, really well. They had really good synergy and I just focused on shot calling instead of actually trying to make plays, even though I have a playmaking champion. So, I think it's just of all the synergy in the team that needs to get going before we're really good. Well, you talk about it needing to get going. You have Najin and Wide Shield rematch coming up. That is so crucial for you guys. Will you be able to catch up in time? Um, I think we showed that yesterday that we could challenge them really hard. We just have a few things to fix, and then I think we could drag a victory back. All right, it'll be a fantastic matchup. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, and we're going to break down that game further at the analyst desk. I'm sure our guys have a lot to say about it. Thank you very much, Shox. Yes, we do have a lot to say, but first I just want to say two for two on the day. Crumbs goes against the rest of the analysts. That's desk, right. Both predictions and gets them both correct. I'm well, so happy I'm wrong. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you're wrong too, um, just for what it's worth. But I, it's worth pointing out, Crumbs. I'm glad is, I'm right. Is, I, I am too. He is the most successful <laughs> player on this entire analyst desk. He's the only team to win a series in the NALCS playoffs. Oh. So I got to say, of course he's right. Good on that. you, Crumbs. Well, let's talk Good about the you. game. Start with picks and bans. Uh, Ramus pick comes out. We've seen it twice this year from the Europeans. Once when Wicked actually played it top, and once when Diamond Prox played it against Fnatic. Uh, not really competitive, Crumbs. I know you played it last year, if memory serves correctly. Uh, I what did we think of it? You said I competitive. <laughs> well, I like I like to see the Ramus. I like the Ramus, but I did not like to see the Jarvan from Meteos. Now, what what tells me seeing that Jarvan pick means that when they early pick Zillion, right off the bat, they're already committing to a mid lane Zillion. That's because you're taking Jarvan because you want a physical jungler while having two magic lanes. So you have Rise top, Zillion mid, really heavy magic damage. If you take an Elise, the other team can really itemize just full on MR and kind of negate three-fifths of your team comp. So they kind of stuck with the Jarvan in that regard, but I feel like they should have put something else. Like, I, the Jarvan is just, it's such a, such a hard champion to pull off, to be honest. Against Alistar, out of all champions, he can literally combo every ability that you have. And when you go in, he combos on your backline, and there is no way you make waves as big as he does. So, Kripal, I like the Morgana pick into a lot of the single target CC from Cloud9. Picks and bans went out that way. The game felt like an extended laning phase, but Alliance seemed to have the strategic edge this time around, pushing around the map. Do you think that's true, or what do you, what's your opinion? I'm not even sure. I think the early game, both teams had good responses to what was going on, but I think what the key factor that broke up and opened this game was a dive on top lane. Basically, getting Aurelia ahead, getting Shook the necessary kill he needs, because if he sits on that build without getting any advantage ever, he's going to suffer through the mid to late game. Diving, if you saw that balls, he just left that top lane after the dive, he could never go back. Cloud9 was playing a very, very tower focused game initially and then transitioned into a dragon. Sure, and Ball sacrificed himself, but Wicked got so big that it was impossible to ignore in the team fights. And I really think that play, that single play, is what basically tilted the game for Alliance. Freak. 
Yeah, I really agree. I really love these dive-focused junglers. We see a lot of teams who want to play a very slow early game. They wait to 50 minutes to do anything. But we've seen how darn good Alistair is. Hits level 6, dives turrets forever. We've seen Ramis, even with rank 1 ball curl, can just dive turrets and tank a bunch of shots and not care about it and just set up these lanes for advantages. And I love these jungle top synergies where they get the one-on-one -on -one kill that match that, that matchup snowballs. And it is often so time, it, it's oftentimes so hard to gank top because of the position on the map that lane is in. You can't flip the matchup back a lot of the time. Crumbs, I see you getting very excited. Yeah, oh, the this is really exciting. So the entire game, Meteos is really trying to counter jungle, counter gank a top lane gank from Ramus. And Ramus never shows up. And he goes, I think, twice and then gives up on it. He's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to triple ward top. So he had a ward in river, a ward at try, and a ward at doubles to protect the gank from Ramus. And then Shook magically finds a way and he just goes through the lane and gets a gank at the perfect opportunity. So he just never never bit the bait that uh, Medios was trying to set up and that ultimately snowballed. Like the, he somehow knew that Medios was putting all of his attention on top and he just completely bypassed it and won the game from that. Well, let's accelerate to about 27 minutes into the game. There was two very dramatic team fights that happened back to back just two minutes apart. So this is the first one at 27 minutes. We will fast forward to the one at 29 minutes when we get there. I think Crepo and Crumbs, you guys were very excited about these two fights. Crepo, kick us off for this one as we roll the clip out and tell me what's happening. I just want to describe like what both teams are trying to do here. This is a very brawly fight. Medios makes a mistake of going in here and then Alliance kind of makes a mistake of overextending into the choke. They could just turn back on Medios and try and kill him. Fogger does a good job jumping and distracting, jumping back immediately right here as well. Wiki goes in deep. But this is the problem. If you engage into a, a, a Morgana, she can soul shack us very efficiently. And that's why Lemonation was building that Zonia so he could keep doing that later in the game. But eventually he fell behind, and then that's why he needed the Mikhail's more as well. Um, the Chrono Shift kind of comes out too late. Bowser's already dead. But uh, what ends up making this a 4v4 is Tabs moving to the left right here. He wants that Morgana so badly, even flashes for it. Keep your eye on Rise right now. Kills Froggen as he spawns. The bomb comes out on Nif later. And Balls basically picks up three kills because Tabs just wanted the Morgana. The game could have been over here already. And the fight could have just been played better on both sides. But it just shows you how much of a brawly uh, type of game this comes. Especially when you add Zillion into the mix with the Chrono Shift. Doing really good things sometimes and doing something really poor as we'll see in the next team fight. Yeah, now we're going to have a fight where the game actually is over after this one. So we start off and notice that Cloud9 has almost no vision into this. They only have a ward at Island. Now that's going to come into play later on when Wiki goes in. Because they have no sight on high. But since he casts a bomb on them, on Wicked, he reveals himself and gives Wicked an opportunity to jump to him. So roll the clip. He jumps in right here. The TP immediately from right. So Alliance disengages, tries to get away from the calling. And right now... Chrono Shift goes on accidentally on high. Meteos goes in. They need to leave at this point. But they get baited by the soul sh by the Morgana by and Morgana goes in to try to distract him with a huge soul shackle, but it's too late. Ryze came in into melee range of Ramos, gets taunted, and you just can't go in, in this positioning. You have to just leave. After Chrono Shift is down, you need to realize how big of an ability this is for your team comp right now and just just accept that they could have left the fight and just leave Morgana to go, but uh, over, -committing, over, over committing to baiting themselves through a bind cost them the game and that fight. Following the rest of the game, it was fairly clean from Alliance. They really didn't put themselves in risky situations. Probably, we haven't heard from you much this segment. What did you take of Alliance's team fights or how Cloud9 played the matchup? Uh, I really liked Alliance on like two big fronts. Uh, the first one was the team fights. I thought they did a really good job of splitting their focus. They had Aurelia and Ari, and you never saw them just stack all on one person. They kind of kept their damage spread around. And like uh, Froggen said in his interview, he got a tankier, more sustained damage build, which I thought was really important. And then uh, the second thing was Alliance's way to win so far has been to focus ganks top. And all of that works really well against C9 because their bot lane isn't super prominent. Sneaky and Lemon haven't been like hard carrying games. So when uh, Alliance is camping top, Cloud9 can't take that much because their bot lane isn't just like stomping that way. Yeah, I just want to point out just a little bit more about that, like the debate about Mikhail's against the Zonias. A lot of people on Twitter were calling out LM, like, why did you not build Mikhail's? You know, is Crepa going to whine about this again? But I actually think if you're if you're Cloud9 <laughs> and you're ahead, I think Zonius is a really good choice for those fights because you can move forward and an alliance can't really turn as hard on you and just nuke somebody down because you'll have the black shields and the turns are very telegraphed. If you're behind, however, you saw they needed that Mikhail's because... And they fell behind, and that's what cost them the game, because you saw Shook at the end of the game. He knew there was no reaction speed on the black shield enough. Flashed on into immediate blow-up, and I couldn't even do a thing. 
Yep, definitely the case. So Alliance keep their playoff chances alive. With that win, they are now 2-2. Two and two. They also make Cloud9 2-2. Two and two. This is making the group of life, as it were, or whatever it is, a little more interesting. All right, guys, we're going to step away for a moment, and when we come back, it is another cross-regional LCS clash as North America's LMQ takes on Europe's Fnatic. Look at Balls, but he gets the kill on Saffronga. Shook will actually go down as well. Balls are still going. Are you kidding me? Oh. Can't deliver any more damage. They pick up one. They pick up two. They're on the Balls now with the Pedra Pulverized. The minion waves are hugely pouring in for Alliance right now. They could look to seal the deal. Balls, one of the last ones standing. Sneaky on the outside. 